All right, Maranatha. Christ is coming, amen? Happy Sabbath to all, especially to those that have maybe today is the first Sabbath, those that have made a decision to, to keep the Lord's Day, to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath holy. So we invite those and those also that are, that are coming and visiting with us this morning. It's a pleasure. I see smiles and we're going to jump right in to the Word, right? We're unveiling Revelation. Your life is about to change forever. Maybe some of you last night did not sleep because of what we learned last night. I've heard of those instances before. Your life is not going to be the change. And as I said last night, we are just beginning into this voyage of understanding what is going to happen in the end times as we are breaking down Revelation. And today, Amazing Facts presents Revelation reveals the image of the beast. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together uh, in this holy place on your holy day to study your holy word as we continue to unveil revelation and, and follow those prophecies, Father, that you have left for us in the end time so that we are prepared, so that we are not deceived by the enemy's trickery. We ask, Father, that as we continue this morning studying uh, the prophecies in Revelation, that you help us, Father, that your Holy Spirit guides us to not only an understanding of your word, but to a keeping and a following of it. Thank you for the blessings, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, which have been our foundation of the prophecy seminar. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the pews. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand, and we would gladly uh, find a Bible for you. Revelation chapter 14. We're going to start on verse 6. Revelation 14, 6. Everybody there? Amen? Amen? It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Right? This message is going to go out to every single human being. There's, and no matter where they are in the world, no matter what language they speak, they will hear this everlasting gospel, right? And where do we find the everlasting gospel, my loved ones? In the sanctuary over there in the Middle East in Jerusalem? No, that sanctuary lost its value. It was, the purpose was to show us how God was going to save us through our sins. Right? The real execution of that plan of salvation is through the heavenly sanctuary. Amen? Through the heavenly sanctuary. And what is that everlasting gospel? It is the forgiveness of sins at the cross of Calvary. It is the victory over your sin, over sin in our lives. Amen? And it is the elimination or eradication of sin from this world and from the universe forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the everlasting gospel. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs. This first angel in this last message of God to the earth is telling us, he's asking us to restore the principles that God established through His Son, Jesus Christ, with the church at Pentecost. He is asking us to restore those principles because those principles have been trampled on. They've been set aside. They've been put to the side and Christians have forgot about these principles that the Lord has established. And it says, verse number 8, And another angel follows, saying, Babylon is fallen and is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon is falling because Babylon does not want to listen. Babylon does not want to preach. Babylon does not want to teach. And Babylon does not want to follow the first angel, which is calling for the restoration of God's principles. And because of that, Babylon, we are going to see, wants to do her own thing. The Bible says Babylon shall fall. In verse number 9, Then a third angel follows, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of God's last warning to the earth before he pours out his wrath without filter, without mercy. From the beginning, God has shown judgment with mercy. But this calling right here in Revelation chapter 14 is God is saying, I'm going to pour my full wrath on this earth on sin and there's going to be no mercy whatsoever. I'm going to undo, I'm going to finish with this world. God's mercy is infinite and endless with those that love him, respect him and honor him. But with those that want to be rebellious, that those that want to do their own thing, that do not want to pay attention and follow the word of God and they want to follow their own ways, 
God is saying, I'm giving you a time, but I, this time is going to end because I'm going to create a new heavens and a new earth where there's no more pain and suffering and sickness and cancer and, and rape and murder and depression and sadness. Amen? That's the new heavens and that's the new earth that God wants to do that. But before that, he is waiting and calling all to come to this everlasting gospel. Now, there's a warning here between following this message or following the beast, following the image of the beast and, and then receiving the mark of the beast. And last night we began to break down the prophecies of Revelation and we saw that the evidence is overwhelming. There are more than 70 characteristics that point to the beast, this little horn, this antichrist power that the enemy has raised up during this time. And this beast power, when we saw all of the characteristics pointed to one system and one system alone, it is impossible that any other system or institution throughout the history of this world can even come close to all of the characteristics, and we just looked at 15 last night, and those 15 were enough to show. And we saw that the beast power, this little horn, is the Vatican with the papacy, right? With the office of the papacy at its feet. Now, remember, we're not talking about Catholics. If you notice, I don't mention the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church is what? Is full of people that worship and honor the Lord based on what they know, based on their understanding of what it means. Amen? They are deceived by the, their own system. And God has loving people in all denominations. Amen? God has loving people in all walks of life. But the call in the end times is to come out of that system because that system is leading its people down the wrong path. It's, it's deceiving its people and they're not following it, right? And we're not even talking, for example, about uh, Francis. Because Francis, technically there are two popes alive right now, right? Benedict was taken out. He, he didn't resign. He was taken out, put to the side, and they put Francis in the seat, right? One king was taken away. The next king was placed. Benedict has no power whatsoever. The power now resides in the one that is sitting on the throne of the papacy. And once again, we're not talking specifically about individuals. We're talking about the system, the institution and what it is teaching. Is everybody with me? Amen. Amen. Now, some people will say, oh, you Adventists. Oh, look at what you're talking about. Oh, you guys are amazing. You're unbelievable. And they'll talk really bad about us. And you can go on the internet and find they'll take us and they'll try to rip us apart. But yet these are the very, this is the very foundation of the Protestant Reformation. These are the foundations of that Protestant Reformation that began over there in Europe with, with Huss and with Wycliffe and with Martin Luther and, and Wesley and all of the great reformers. This is nothing new. The problem is that what has happened to the Protestant Reformation movement is the question that we are going to be asking over the next nights. What has happened because it seems that the protest is over. But prophecy clearly states that this system is going to continue to do what it did again, right? Now, let's go back and let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and go over what we're studying because we are warned already against the beast, but it warns us against the image of the beast. So we have half of the equation one because the image of the beast, we already know who the beast is or this Vatican system, the papacy is the beast. So the question then is, what is the image of the beast that we are not supposed to worship either? We are not supposed to obey. Remember, if you want to worship God, what's the word? Obey God. Amen? The greatest form of worship is obedience. We said the word worship in Greek is the word proskuneo. It means to put your forehead on the ground. And what is that? A symbol of what? Humbling yourselves. Humility. And saying, Lord, I am here. Thank you for all you have done for me. After seeing what Christ has done. After bringing himself, the creator becoming a creation. And seeing that, what are we supposed to do? The greatest manifestation of love. Amen? And it leads us to obedience. It leads us out of love, respect, and trust in what God has done for us. That's why we follow our Lamb. Amen? That's why we follow. Revelation chapter 13. Everybody there? And it says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. Right? So coming out of the sea, we know seas represent people, multitude, nations, and a beast. We know that we're talking about the different levels of the beast, specifically that fourth beast in Revelation. And it says, having seven heads. What do seven heads represent? Seven, seven hills, the seven mountains. Rome is known as the city on seven hills. Having ten horns. Ten horns is the what? 
the division of the, of, the, of the Roman Empire, the western side of the Roman Empire, broke apart and it d divided into ten nations, ten tribes. And on his head, ten crowns, because the crowns represent what? Monarchies, kings, and queens, which is exactly what happened in the western part of the Roman Empire in Europe. And it says, and on his head's a blasphemous name. We saw blasphemy last night. Is that one that says what? Blasphemy is one that says he has the power to forgive sins or the one that what? That believes he is God on earth. And when we look in the sanctuary, when we look in the most holy place, we see the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's throne. The, the Ark where the Ten Commandments are inside because the Ten Commandments are the foundation of God's kingdom, of God's government. And we see these two angels, right, that represent the throne of God where the Shekinah glory would be represented there. And Isaiah saw this fulfilled in prophecy, and he saw God's throne in heaven as vision. Amen? And of course, when we look at this, the imagery is astounding. It's amazing because what? Because that's exactly what they're saying, right? Once again, the office say they believe to be God on earth. We didn't say that. I didn't have to say that. Last night, they said it themselves. Quotes from popes, quotes from, from uh, theologians, from, from all different aspects of the walk across uh, Catholicism, pointing and saying that he is Christ he is the representative of Christ on this earth. He is God on earth, which we saw biblically is, it's a blasphemy. Is everybody with me? And then we looked at the prophecies, and as we looked at Revelation chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 2, we saw that the prophecies were preparing us to go into Revelation and the master key. And we're seeing that Babylon, Medo-Persia, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and then the division of the Roman Empire into how many pieces? Into ten. It broke apart and then it became what is known as the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, right? And that was the coming together of church and state. And then we went into Daniel chapter 7 and looked at these four beasts. And these four beasts were following the prophecy as it was going along. But once again, the focus was on that fourth beast, on the toes, on the ten horns, which was the division of the European nation, of uh, the western part of the uh, Roman Empire, which is known as Europe today. And now Revelation 13 takes us back to this beast power with seven heads and ten horns. And it says in verse 2, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the beat of, a fair, of the bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Right? The coming together of all of these powers. Why are these four powers specifically? Why Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greek, and the Roman Empire? Not, not so many other nations. Very simply, because these are the four nations that the devil used to do what? To oppress to imprison, to try to destroy God's people. These four nations are those four nations. Four superpowers that the devil tried to use to destroy God's people, specifically to destroy the seed, to destroy the lineage who the devil knew was the one that was going to destroy him. Is everybody following me? Amen? And it says, The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads that if it had been mortally wound, one of those heads was who? The, the Antichrist, the little horn, right? Which we know as the papacy. And we saw that it received its mortal wound in what year? In the year 1798. Exactly at the end of the 1,260 years, uh, Napoleon sent his general birth year into Rome and the, pape, and the Pope Pius was taken captive and he died in captivity. And the whole world thought that that was the end of the papacy as political powers, right? That was the end of it. No more political power. It was done away with, set aside. But the prophecy continues to say, and I saw one of his heads that it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. So this is looking past and into the future. That wound is going to be healed. That means we saw that that wound was caused by the sword, which was the civil power. And that wound is going to be healed because the papacy is going to restore the civil authority and power that it had during the 1,260 years when it reigned supreme on Europe. They are going to recuperate that power and do what? Once again impose the system of worship that they did. And if you do not follow the system of worship, it's not a respecter of your liberty of conscience, right? They are imposed and they believe that God has given them the power to punish heretics, to carry out judgment on people. And that's why, when you remember the 2,300-year 2, prophecy, it said, until when was God going to permit the little horn to continue to step on the sanctuary? And it said, until 2,000, 
300 years, right? Until 1844, because God says, now I have let this little horn carry out its false system of worship through the Inquisition, but now I am going to set up my true system of judgment. Amen? And that's what we saw when Jesus Christ began his earthly ministry, I'm sorry, his heavenly ministry in the holy place and began to what? To carry out his works of judgment, which is not to condemn and kill, but it is to what? To vindicate and to save. Amen? Totally opposite to what the, the Vatican was doing at that time. And it says, verse number four, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with the beast? It says there that the world marvels at the beast. And we saw that everywhere that the Pope stands, millions and millions, it doesn't matter what country, what place, it is. there's no human being on earth that the world responds to in this way. Nobody. And it continues to say, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies once again, taking the position of God, saying that he is God on earth, saying that he has the power to forgive sins. We saw that clearly last night. He was given authority to continue for how long? 42 months or 1,260 days or 1,260 years. For that time period, he did what he wanted and he prospered, but it came to an end in the year 1798. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And we saw how the sanctuary, the plan of salvation, has been trampled on every single furniture and every single ministry of Jesus Christ through the heavenly sanctuary has been set aside. And they have implanted and they have put their own position of how a human being can be saved. And we saw a quote from them very clearly with the Pope saying, it is only through complete subjection, it is only through complete obedience to the papacy that a person can be saved. That is their belief and they have not changed their beliefs. Nothing has changed, my loved ones. The only thing that changes is that they don't have the civil power to impose it anymore. But prophecy says they will continue to do that again. Continues to say, in verse number 7, it was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. The Inquisition is the attack on God's people that just wanted to follow Scripture, just wanted to live by it, right? Can you imagine if they just wanted to live by it and just because they chose to live differently? Imagine what's going to happen to those that speak against it. This is what we're looking at. It was granted to make war with them with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over what? Over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Who? All. This is a worldwide situation. This is a worldwide system. This is not some regional power. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not what? Have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Why? Because when your name is written in the book of the, Lamb, of the life of Lamb, you know why? It's because you have submitted yourself, you have humbled yourself, and you are obeying God's word. Amen? You are following God's word, you are following his scripture, and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been baptized by submersion, and you continue to follow in the other things, the other principles and foundations, all the way to the most holy place that God has established for us to return into the presence of the Father. Amen? Through the holy place, through the, through the holy of holies, in the ark of the covenant, God's commandments, restoring and redeeming all of these principles. And it says, if anyone has an ear, let him what? Who has an ear here? Raise your hand if you have an ear. Then we should be listening. Amen? He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity, and he who kills with the sword must be what? Killed with the sword. Is that not what happened with the papacy? Yes, it's giving us a definition. It's giving us a summary. He took into captivity. Millions were taken into captivity and died in captivity. And they were the lucky ones if they were not tortured and murdered to death. And it says here, and he killed by the sword, that means that he must be killed by the sword. He used the papacy, the civil power, the civil authority to impose. And if you did not follow it, this is nothing new. History teaches that you were executed, burned to the stake, tortured, buried alive in so many different ways. This is what history teaches and this is nothing new. Here is the patience and the what? Verse 11. Then I saw another beast. Then, or after, after what? After the papacy had been what? Taken a captivity and killed by the sword. John then sees after this event, 
he sees another beast or another nation or kingdom. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to what? To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was? So this second beast or this second nation we're seeing is not conquering the other nations. It is what? It is coming up and using that first nation, that first beast, the papacy, and is working together. They're partners, and we're going to see that this is almost like a honeymoon that they have. They're working together. He performs talking about the second beast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and what? And lived. And look at this. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be. What is going to happen again? This second beast is going to give life back to the first beast. That means that that civil power is going to be restored. And once again, the papacy is going to have the civil power and authority that it had during the 1,260 years. And it is going to what? Impose once again through that second beast a what? This false system of worship. And if you do not follow it, you are going to be nothing new. History is going to repeat itself. He was granted power. Verse number 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Six, six. Now, we saw last night that we took the Vicarious Fili Dei, which is the official title in Latin of the Pope, right? The papacy. And when we used their own Roman numeric system, when we did the values, it came up to be six, six, six. This is not a coincidence. But our focus today is on that second beast. Because this second beast is where now we have to pay attention. Sadly, I say it with a great burden in my heart. Most Christians are telling and teaching that the prophecies in Revelation are going to be fulfilled through the Middle East, through literal Jerusalem, right? Through literal sanctuary and that, that uh, Ro, um, I'm sorry, um, Russia and China and the Muslims and the United States and there's going to be this great big battle of Armageddon. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to think, my loved ones. Prophecy does not say look over to the Middle East, look over to the old sanctuary. Prophecy is pointing to Rome. Prophecy is saying look at what Rome is doing. That's where your focus has to be because that is the Antichrist problem. That is the one that is trying to take Christ's place. And sadly, my loved ones, the majority are following right down that line. Amen? So praise the Lord that God has given us this message to share and to preach. So that what? So that people can come out of Babylon. Amen? But it's this second beast that we're focusing on today that we're going to go and delve into and let this come up. Now, this second beast, it says there, is going to raise an image to the first beast, right? And if you don't worship that image that the second beast rises, raises up about for the first beast, it says that you are going to be killed. And it's going to use a number of things. It's buying and selling. So there's, there's, there's financial institutions involved here, right? There are a number of different things that are happening that they are going to coerce people to receive the mark of the beast. Now, the mark of the beast is not the number 666. 666 is the number of the name of the beast. The mark of the beast is going to be used because it is the mark of who? Of the beast or the Vatican. We're going to be talking about that during the week. But the second beast is going to impose this false system of worship. It is going to enforce it. So the question is, who is the second beast or the second nation that is going to lift up an image to the Vatican? Right? Who is this second beast or the second nation that is going to give the power back to the Vatican to impose once again his system of false worship. If I ask a question for you, is there anywhere in the Bible where it talks to us about lifting up an image and worshiping this image? And if you didn't worship that image, you were going to be killed. Yes or no? Daniel chapter 
3. Let's go there. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Because history repeats itself, my loved ones. Daniel chapter 3. If you open your Bible, halfway it gives you the book of Psalms. And then you start moving to your right. <clears throat> start moving to your right and you will come across all of the fascinating books. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. Remember that Daniel and Revelation go hand in hand. It is telling us exactly the things that are going to happen in the end times. Daniel chapter 3. Everybody there? Nebuchadnezzar, the king. The king of where? Babylon. Aren't we told to watch out with Babylon in Revelation? Nebuchadnezzar, the king, of the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 60 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, and King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrate, and all the officials of the providence to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had what? Had set up. Notice who was invited to this dedication. All the state, right? All the officials, right? All the businessmen, everybody in society, all nations, Tribes, tongue, people. When the king calls, everybody better show up. To a what? Notice the word. A dedication. So it's like, let's say, for example, one time in Puerto Rico, they had this really great idea of, of bringing this statue of Christopher Columbus over. Right? And they were going to raise up this statue in a certain part of Puerto Rico as a dedication and a, and a commemoration for, for Christopher Columbus' great discoveries. Right? So, but... It never happened. But let's say, for example, something like that happened here, right? And let's say uh, the president of the United States, Barack Obama, says, hey, let's lift up this great statue, right? It's a great dedication to, uh, I don't know, Martin Luther King, right? We're going to bring up this great image in the statue, and we're going to remember Martin Luther King. And he calls everybody. Everybody's going to show up, amen? Everybody's going to show up because if you don't show up, you're going to say, oh, you're not showing up because you disagree with. No, no, no. Everybody's going to show up. Continues. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O who? Peoples, nations, and languages. Ooh. O oh, people, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psalmistry, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Notice that what began as what? As a dedication ceremony ended up as a... Worship ceremony. Is there deceit here? Oh, yes, there is great deception here. And notice another of one of the instruments that the devil uses for deception, and it's music. Music. Maybe you've come, as you've been coming to our seminars, or you come here this morning, and you notice that a music is a little different than most other places, right? There is a specific reason for that, is because God is holy. God is holy. God is special. And we don't come to worship God with any type of music. We don't bring the common stuff that the world uses to, to, to enjoy themselves. God has what? Special music because God is special and unique and holy. Amen? And this is the difference. And we, I go to a lot of Christian churches and I see the form of worship. And they're, it's a sensual form of worship. It's dancing and shaking and becomes very sensual. And the Bible warns us about these things. Don't bring strange fire into my house. My house is a holy house. And when he's talking about this house, he's not talking just about this house. He's talking about your home. And he's talking about the house of the Holy Spirit, which is this body right here. We have to be very careful because Ezekiel tells us that the instruments were created for Lucifer when he was created. He was the, direct, the musical director in heaven. He knows how to manipulate music like anyone. If you want to find or, or listen to a fascinating music seminar, it's called Distraction Dilemma by Christian Berdal. I don't know if everybody ever heard of it, right? It's a fascinating music seminar, and he breaks down studies, the scientific evidence of how, how music is used to manipulate the mind 
And people say, it's only about the, the lyrics. No, the lyrics is one thing, but the music is even more important than the lyrics because it can take you and take that frontal lobe, that alpha, and knock it out, and you'll be in this zone of what? Hypnotic zone, which is what the devil wants you to do. So you won't hear the music, so you won't pay attention. The music that we praise to God should be elevating our minds towards the heavenly kingdom, amen? Paying attention to the words, making us focus on how great and how wonderful and holy God is. If it makes you shake from your neck down, it's doing the wrong thing. That part of the shaking is for the husband and wife and the intimacy in their, in their bedrooms, amen? In their relationship, not to bring to the church, amen? Continues to say, so at the time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and symphony with the kind of music, all the people, all nations and all languages fell down and did what? And worshipped the golden image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and they accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever, you king. Have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psalter singing, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and do what? And worship the golden image. A decree was passed or a law. A law that contradicted what? The law of God. Are we paying attention? A law that contradicted the law of God. By who? By the state. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Please, my loved ones, pay attention that Babylon makes war against God's people through God's law. It's trying to make God's people not follow God's law. And we saw that last night already as they think, as the Vatican believes, they have the power to modify, change, explain, and even eliminate and create new laws over God's laws. And this is the main issue that we are seeing here, and it is the main issue that is happening in Revelation. There is an issue with God's law. Babylon makes war on God's law. Now, these three young Hebrew boys, they preferred to die than to disobey God. Amen? These three boys, none of them were more than 20 years old. So don't tell me young people cannot be consecrated to the Lord. You know who it depends on? Depends on how they were brought up, on their family, on their parents. Amen? The church has influence, school has influence, but the first place is in the home. And these three young boys decided to prefer to die than to bow their knees down and worship the image. Why? Because they knew that that would be disobeying God's law, the second commandment. Thou shalt not have images, thou shalt not bow down to them. They knew that and they preferred to die. And they were not the only Jews. They were not the only Hebrews in Babylon. There was approximately almost 60,000, and that was only three did not bow down. Once again, the whole world, beginning with, with the church. Just because you say, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean you're going to go into heaven, but those that do obey the will of my Father. Amen? Now, going back to the, st to the second beast. This second beast we're going to see has three stages. First, it's what before it becomes a beast. Second is after it becomes a beast. And the third stage is when this beast makes the world worship the first beast or the Vatican. This beast power then is going to what? Enforce this system of worship. It is going to restore it. Now, in what stage are we right now? We're on the second stage where it's a beast. But the third stage is what? When it makes the Vatican, it is going to come into marriage with the Vatican, and they are going to then impose on the world this false system of worship. Is everybody with me? Now, this second beast is interesting. He's going to rise up and be formed because of the abuses of the first beast. This is where it gets fascinating. It rises up because of against the first beast, but then it's going to join that first beast and participate in his sins in the same way. Is everybody following me? Now, remember the characteristics of a second of a beast is what? Of a beast is a nation or a kingdom that dominates politically, economically, militarily, culturally, and technologically. This is a world superpower that we're talking about. Is everybody following me? Now, we just read Revelation 13 when it tells us what this beast is going to do, this second beast, when it even rises. But we're going to study then to know who this beast is. We have to go 
before it becomes a beast. And fascinating that Revelation chapter 12, 13 and 14, I told you, and we mentioned, is the climax of what? Of the great controversy between God and the devil. 12, 13, and 14. And 12 starts with the coming forth of the seed, and 12 and 14 finishes with the second coming of the seed at the return to end with this world. And in between those, two, those three chapters, we have the great controversy played out. We're talking, of course, on a political level, but we'll see it also played out on a spiritual level because the main issue here is religious. The main issue here is spiritual. There are political elements to it which this first beast is using out against the word of God. So let's go, please, and let's study the beginning of the beast before it became a beast so we can identify it very easily. Go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is a chapter we have not studied but tonight we are going to begin with Revelation chapter 12. We've studied chapter 13. We've looked at chapter 14. And today we're going to do chapter 12. Everybody there? Revelation chapter 12. The beginning of the great controversy. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with what? With the sun and with the moon under her feet. And on her head a garland of? 12 stars. And then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give, to give birth. We know that this woman, a woman in prophecy represents a church, God's people, right? 12 stars representing the leadership of the church. That's why the multiples of 12, 24 elders, 144,000, 72 that went out to preach. And another sign appeared. Now, I'm sorry, this woman, and what stage is this woman in? She's pregnant, that means that the Messiah hasn't come yet. The seed hasn't come. So when it talks about this woman, who are we talking about? Who did the seed come up amongst? The Hebrew nation, right? They had the sanctuary. They had the old covenant sanctuary. They had the law, right? They had the promises. They were the descendants. But it continues. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red what? Dragon, which is China, of course. Who's the dragon? The devil. Mm. And notice this. Having seven heads and ten horns. Now, we already know who has seven heads and ten horns. It's making reference to the Roman Empire in its different stages, right? In its different stages. And it says here that who's behind this beast power? The, the devil is behind it. The devil will not attack you directly. But he'll use what? He'll use humans. He'll use institutions, governments to attack God's people. It says, with seven diadems, which are crowns on his head, and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now, was the devil literally standing when, when Mary went to give birth to Jesus Christ? Was he literally standing there waiting for him to come out to devour him? No, it's talking symbolically, right? Who did the devil use? That beast, or who? The Roman Empire in its first stage, right? Through Herod, the Roman Empire through Herod tried to do what? All babies less than two years old? Kill them because he knew. He said, I don't know where the seed is, but the seed is being born around here. We have to kill them. And it continues to say then that the child was born. And remember in verse number five, it talks about the birth. The life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ in one verse. Why in only one verse? Because the focus of Revelation chapter 12 is not the child or the seed. The row focus is on the, on the woman or on God's people or on God's church. Amen? Continues to say, verse number 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there for how long? 1,000 260 days or 1260 years that began in the year 538 and ended in the year 1798 so the woman of the church was what was protected by God part of God's people were attacked right because the war was made on them but another part was protected the woman was protected and this is the number of groups we're going to see how this plays out it says then it talks about the war breaking out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, right? We're going to have a study on that next Sabbath. Who was Michael the archangel? 
And it continues to say, But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven or any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the, some of the world. The whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Remember, he was cast out the second time from heaven because he was technically there representing what? The earth because he was the king of the earth. But when Christ resurrects, he says, that's it. Your kingdom is done. Now it's my kingdom. I have defeated you, and I now have the rightful heir to the earth. I am the king of this earth. Amen? And then it continues to say in verse number 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and his power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God. Day and night has been cast out. Amen? Verse number 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. And the devil then when he comes back, when he is kicked out of heaven the second time, he changes his strategy. And instead of attacking, he'll still attack the church, right? But outside means. But now he infiltrates the church and says, ah, the more I kill them, the more they come out. So I have to change my strategy. And he infiltrates the church and starts to what? To corrupt it from within. That's why God calls for the restoration of those principles because the devil, very, very, in a very meticulous way, he then enters the church and corrupts it from within. And it says there, now, verse 13, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So what does he do? He can't take it out on Christ anymore. Christ resurrected, he defeated him, he's up in heaven. So what does he do? I'm going to take it out on, their, on his children. The devil is a devil, my loved ones. When he can't take you, he's going to attack those that you love. Continues to say, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a times, times and half a time. Amen. Once again, 1,260 years. The church was protected. Amen. And the wilderness, it was protected. And this is making reference to the inside of Europe, a number of different groups that fled from Rome, that fled outside of the cities where, where the Vatican had its powers, groups like the Valdensians, right? And a number of other groups, history teaches that they, they kept their faith. They never walked away from the faith that they had and they moved out and they, went, they fled to the mountains where there was nobody. And they fled out and left. And for centuries they kept their faith. Amen? And they were persecuted and they were killed. But, not, but their faith was there. God's church was still there despite all the things that were happening. And it says, verse number 20, 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the, by the flood. And flooded waters, right, represents people, nation, multitudes. So what is the devil doing? He's using the powers of Europe to try to what? To destroy the church. He's corrupting it from within, but at the same time, he's attacking them. He's trying to destroy the church using the powers of the state. And it says here, but the what? The earth helped the woman. Amen. And the earth swallowed up its mouth, opened its mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was in rage with who? With the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who do what? Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice that God didn't change his people. It's the same people, right? But those that then accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior were coming to the church, coming to God's people, and those that rejected the Messiah were taken out. God's people then in the end times are going, the devil is going to make war on it. Now notice, the woman was attacked by this dragon or this beast with seven heads and ten horns, right? It's that same dragon or beast that what? That the woman in Revelation 17 or the harlot, which is an adulterous church that does not follow christ that follows her own things she is sitting on what on a beast with seven heads and ten horns because who is the devil using to attack god's people in the end time who is the devil going to use to make this war that revelation 12 17 is talking about he's going to use her he's going to use the babylonian system with the vatican and those that want to stay loyal to the lord and faithful they will be attacked by her we're going to go into that tonight in much more depth and much more uh details is everybody following me this is the situation and how does the devil make war on god's people 
from Revelation chapter 12, 17? The answer is very simple. Read Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 details how the devil was going to carry out his plan using what? Using the adulterous church, the Vatican. Is everybody with me? Now, let's start to break down the characteristics because you, without knowing it, we have just identified the second beast. Did you realize that? You didn't realize it. Let's break it down then. Number one, this, this beast, remember, before it becomes a beast, protects the woman from the snake dragon or the state church. It says there that the woman was being attacked, and what happened? She fled where? She fled for 1,260 years, and then she fled to where? To the, to the wilderness was first, the church was protected, but it says there she went to the earth. In Spanish, it says, it says to the land. Amen? It went to the land. She was protected by this land that was attacking her. It says then, number two, then I saw another beast coming up out of the what? Out of the earth. Notice something, that is coming up after. After what? I saw after what? The 1798 when the papacy was taken into captivity. After he sees this other beast raise up where? From the earth, that same earth or land that protected the woman in Revelation chapter 12, then what? From that land comes up a a beast or a nation. And notice that it says coming up. The word coming up is the Greek word for is anabaino, which means to grow or flourish and is used in the context of the development of a plant. Amen? So this beast rises up and it doesn't conquer other beasts. It rises up slowly like a plant. It grows on its own. Everybody with me? So there's not, there's not major wars like the other beast. This beast rises up from itself in the same land that protected the woman or protected the church. Everybody following me? Amen? This beast is a, or a dominant world power. He does not conquer another beast. And notice it comes out from the land, not the sea. So if sea represents people, nations, multitudes, tribes, right, where you have all of this, monarchies and all this, that means that this beast is rising up where there is not people, nations, tribes, and multitudes. So it's a land that is what? Scarcely developed, not like Europe. It is brand new. It's nothing, it's nothing is happening here. Notice number three, it rises up west of Rome because prophecy moves from east to west. If you notice the map, here's Babylon. Here's Babylon, uh, uh, Asia, right? The Persians and the, and the Babylonians. And then it moved west. Here's the Greeks. Here's Rome. So... That means that prophecy is moving from east to west. That means that this nation has to rise up west of Rome. It has to rise up in this direction in that area. Number four, had two horns like a what? Like a lamb. That means it had two horns, and we know that a horn represents what? A kingdom or a, a nation. So just like in Daniel chapter 8, where we saw the Medo-Persians, right? They had two horns because there were two nations or kingdoms inside of this beast. This beast has also two kingdoms or two nations. Now, it's a lamb. A lamb represents what in the word of God? A, a what? A young nation that represents Christ or Christians. A lamb is talking about in the Bible, Jesus Christ. So this nation has what? Has a Christian foundation, has Christian principles. Notice that it has no crowns on horns. Why no crowns? Because there are no monarchs. There are no kings or queens. Everybody following me? Now, talking about those two horns, Jesus Christ recognized two kingdoms or two nations when he was on this earth. Are you following me? This beast then has these two nations or kingdoms inside of it, just like the meat in the Persian one. But it has to be what? It has to be as a lamb, so it has to be two nations that the lamb recognized, two nations that are theirs. Everybody follow me? Now, let's go and let's find these two. Go with me, please, to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. John chapter 18, let's find out these two kingdoms that Jesus Christ recognized. John 18, let's go to verse 35. Amen? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is what? 
is not from here. Jesus Christ has brought the kingdom of God to the earth, and he says the kingdom of God is what? Is here. Did Jesus Christ recognize the kingdom of heaven or the church in its place on this earth? Oh, yes, he did. He said this kingdom, amen? He is establishing his kingdom, the kingdom of God. Go with me now to verse 19. Verse 19, right? Chapter 19, I'm sorry. Chapter 19 right there. Jesus returns to Pontius Pilate. 9, 10. 19, 10. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have what? Power to crucify you and power to release you. What power is he talking about? The civil power, right? I have that power to crucify you or I can release you. Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Did Jesus Christ recognize that Pontius Pilate had civil authority? Yes, he did. He said, you have power, but that power that you have, that civil authority that you have was given to you from heaven. Amen? And the Bible clearly teaches us that what? That we are to recognize the legitimate power of the civil state, right? And obey it as, all, as long as it keeps in its jurisdiction. Jesus Christ recognizes two kingdoms in this beast, on this earth. And which one are those? Church and state. So if you notice, this beast has these two kingdoms. And notice, it's not like the Medo-Persian one, where one horn was bigger than the other one, and then the other one grew farther. These two horns are what? They're separate, but they're equal one is not over the other there is a balance between these two kingdoms or these two nations in this beast everybody following me jesus says matthew 22 17 he said to them therefore render to caesar the things that are caesar's and to god the things that are god's jesus christ is recognizing and respecting civil authority as long as it does not jump into the first table of the commandments amen number five it speaks like a dragon that means it appears to be like christ but will what? But will eventually speak like the dragon who is the? The devil. Now a nation speaks through their laws. Number six, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. That means he is present with the Vatican and works together to, infall, to enforce this false system of worship. Number seven, causes the earth and them which dwell thereon to worship. The first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, to cause the whole world to worship, that means you have to be a what? Have great global, political, and military power because you're forcing the world to do something. It can't be some regional power. And then worship, it's entering the religious sphere to force the world to obey the Vatican. Number eight, does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven to earth before men and fools. That's like in Daniel chapter 3, those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. We're going to see this in an upcoming presentation, how this is going to be fulfilled. Number nine, says to them that dwell on the earth that they what? That they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and what? And did live. That word saying is the Greek word ask or persuade. That's why it says that they should. That means that this beast at first is going to do what? Is going to persuade those in it or persuade them to do this. That means it's a what? If you're persuading, it's talking about a political system that has the foundation of democracy. It's going to persuade, ask them to do these things. Number 10, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should speak. The beast had received a mortal wound but now lives and talks Resume civil power through the second beast or the second power. Number 11, causes that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Once again, religious persecution through civil power. Number 12, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Once again, to force the world to submit to this power, you have to have great world political and military power. Number 13, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. That means that this beast or this world power has to have global economic powers. Everybody follow me. Now the Vatican believes that God has given them the right to control the conscience of all and to define punishment of heretics. They have not imposed their will by force as they did during the 1,260 years because they don't have the civil power to do it 
yet. But this second beast of this second nation is the one that is going to give it. Now, we're going to look at the summary of the present and past characteristics, and it's going to easily show us to define exactly what this beast is. Summary of the present characteristics. One, it protected believers that fled religious persecution in Europe. Number two, it became a beast or a superpower after the year 1798, which means it has political, mil political military, economic, cultural, and technological power. Number three, it is a young superpower because it is a lamb that, does con that doesn't conquer another superpower, but emerges slowly. Number four, it emerges where there are no people, multitudes, nations, and languages. That means there are few scattered people around. Number five, it is located west of Rome. Number six, it separates church and state because there's no papacy and there's no king. And number seven, it is a Christian nation that began with democratic principles. And my loved ones, if you have not figured out by now what this second beast is, who this nation is that is going to give back the power to the papacy, it is going to restore. There is no nation on earth after 1798 that fills all of these principles, that fills all of these characteristics. There is only one superpower in the world and one nation that can do it, and it is the United States of America. Now, before you jump out of your seat and call me anti-patriotic, that's not what we're talking about, amen? We're talking about a system that the prophecy is pointing to that is going to do this. And what we are going to do for the remainder of the time, for a few minutes that we have left here, and tonight and over the remainder of the seminar, we're going to show how this is happening to a perfect T. The prophecy teaches that the United States of America, this great country of ours, is going to is slowly walking or stepping away from the Christian principles which with it has been founded. Am I lying or not? Oh, this is what's happening, right? Now, let's start to break some of these down, and we're going to go until time permits, and then we'll end. It says, Charles Cratmer, a Pulitzer Prize-winning syndicated columnist, author, and political commentator in the Sydney Morning Herald, he says, the fact is, talking about the United States, that there is no country that has been as dominant culturally, economically, technologically, and military in the history of the world since the Roman Empire. Now, let's look at the characteristics. Does the United States qualify to protect the woman or the church from the snake dragon state church that was being attacked in Europe? Oh, yes. It says that she what? She fled to where? She fled to the land. She fled to the earth to protect her. And that's exactly what happened when? With who? With the pilgrims, right? They were fleeing. There are a number of people that left Europe for a number of different reasons. But these people left. Why? Because they wanted to worship and obey God out of their own consciousness, out of what they read, right? They made a number of mistakes when they got here, but originally what were they seeking? Religious freedom. From what? From religious persecution in Europe. That's what they were looking for, and that's how millions and millions of people came to this country because of this. Everybody following me? Number two, then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. Now, after what year? 1798. It became a beast, remember. Before 1798, it wasn't a beast. So around this time, 1798, was the United States rising up? Oh, the United States of America declared its independence in the year 776. The Constitution was passed in the year 1787. The Bill of Rights was adopted in the year 1791. And we were clearly recognized as a world power by the year 1798. I have a question. The beast or the dominant world power, are we a world power? We are the only world power. We are the only beast on the earth coming up right that means it comes up that means it flourishes and it's used in the context of the development of a plan is that what happened with this country yes right we didn't have to conquer another superpower we didn't have to destroy any other superpower we did destroy and we did right very bad things to the native indians but they weren't a superpower they were just tribes that were dispersed out among they were not peoples multitudes nations right did this happen yes the united states flourished almost basically by itself some little conflicts and issues here, but we did not have to conquer any superpower. And it does not conquer another beast. And it comes out from the land where there's not sea, not multitudes of people. There were people, but they were not established as in Europe. Is everybody following me? Everybody keeping with me? Rises up west of Rome because prophecy moves from where? From east to? From east to west. Now, when we look at a map, here's Asia, here's Europe. And if you're going to point at Rome, what comes west of Europe, of, of, of Rome? 
Well, you have Spain and Portugal. They were already, they were part of the system. So you have to keep on going west. And what's west of Spain and Portugal and of Europe? The Atlantic Ocean, the land that was now called the United States of America. That's prophecy moving across. Number four, had two horns like a lamb. These two horns or two kingdoms or what? Separate but equal. This is where it starts getting very fascinating. It's a lamb. That means it's a young nation with Christian foundation and Christian principles. Is that not this church founded on Christian, uh, this, 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 this country founded on Christian principles? The founders of these countries were all, in their great majority, Christian men that had prayer sessions, that had all of these parts of it, right? That no crowns or horns, that's because why? No monarchs or no? Why did this country develop? From the abuses in Europe. This country came up because of what? Because of the abuses of the Pope and because of the abuses of the state. Either one, pick your poison. Either the Pope was telling the state what to do or the state in the, cake, in the case of England was telling what? What did Henry do? He took control of the church and the state is telling the church what to do, right? And either way, it's not God's church and they were persecuted in England because of that and that's why they fled in a number of different places. All of this what? The same foundation. They were running away from that. Now, we know that this country was founded, right? By men, Christian men that just wanted to what? Be able to live. Now, did they make mistakes? Of course they did, but in principle, right? On paper, it's a beautiful thing that they created, amen? It's a beautiful thing. This country is a country that is founded, my loved ones, on Bible prophecy. Amen? The Bible prophecy points to this nation rising up and taking. You think that this nation is here? just? There is no other nation in the history of the world that has done and innovated and set standards that, as, that we have in this nation. Amen? We've made a lot of mistakes, and a lot of those mistakes is because we walk away from the Christian principles that were founded from this country. But that's what the intention, that's what these men did, amen? And they did a very good job. The Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776 says what? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. What? That's absurd. That's blasphemous. What do you mean all men? I'm a king. I'm not equal to these peasants. Woo! We don't see that as amazing, but in this time, this was revolutionary. All men are created equal. That's, a, that's, a, that's impossible. I'm a royal king. That's what this country founded. That they are endowed by who? By their creator with certain what? Unalienable rights. Amen? That means those are rights that cannot be taken away. They are God-given rights. Praise the Lord. That among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to serve, to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of who? That's absurd. That is completely absurd, I'm sorry, they're thinking in these times. How is it possible that the government gets their power from the governed? Well, praise the Lord, because that's exactly what was established here, amen? And if you notice, since this point, almost all democratic nations in this world have a follow the pattern of our Constitution, because that's how wonderful it is, amen? Beautiful stuff. And what is the Bill of Rights is known as the first ten amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America. These amendments limit the power of the federal government and guarantee the rights and freedoms of individuals. Amen? It is put there for what? To protect against the abuses of the state and it's set there to protect us from the abuses of the majority. It's that protection there to both to keep those two at bay, both the government becoming too abusive and the majority imposing their will on us. And look at what the First Amendment says of the Constitution. Amendment, the First Amendment number one, freedom of speech, Press, religion, peaceful assembly, and petition of what? Freedom of what? Of religion. I didn't hear an amen for that. Amen. amen. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Why is this? Because of the abuses that were happening in Europe. They said, we don't want a pope. We don't want somebody enforcing their religion on us. But we don't want the state also telling us what religion to establish. We want a separation of church and state. They're both here. Both kingdoms are recognized in this country. They're both legitimate and they're both uh, protected by the Constitution. But one doesn't tell the other one what to do, supposedly. Right? 
The church can't tell the state what to do, and the state can't tell the church what to do. They can work together, but if one tries to impose the other, there is a constitutional amendment there, right, to separation of church and state. Can I hear an amen for that? And if you start going down the long list, I love this, this, uh, this quote by Clinton Rustier. He's an American historian. The twin doctrines of separation of church and state and liberty of individual conscience are the marrow of our democracy, if not indeed America's most magnificent contribution to the freeing of the Western man. Amen? Fascinating stuff. The purpose, the reason why this country has been so successful, has been so able to grow and become the great power that we are is because of what? Because we separated church and state. Amen? They're both here. They're both respected, but they keep their places, and that has been the greatest blessing. Amen? Not forcing anybody to do what they don't want to do. You are free. If I want to worship this microphone, as absurd as it may be, I have the right to do that. And nobody can tell me anything, right? If I want to build a b building and put, it, put the microphone in the middle and say, let's worship the microphone. Well, the problem is technically not with me. It's with those who come and follow me, right? But I can do that, and I'm free to do it as, as crazy as it may seem. I have a constitutional right to do those things, amen? And that's a beautiful thing. Let people follow what they will, as long as they're not in any way, shape, or form infringing upon your rights. They are free to follow their own rights. Is everybody following me? And when you look at this, the two foundations of the American system of government, civil and religious liberty, both guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States, Civil liberty found its expression in a republican form of government. Religious freedom found its liberty in where? In Protestantism. Amen? No pope, nobody telling us what to do and how to worship God. We come to the word of God and we worship God on our own conscience and how we want to do it. Amen? Praise the Lord for that. That's why it said the prophecy says that the woman was going to protect the church from the attacks of the church state that the dragon was using in Europe. A place where the church can come and can develop and grow and not have to worry about these things. Be free from church persecution. Amen? From church and state persecution. Benjamin Franklin, in a letter to Richard Price, October 9, 1790, founding fathers of this country, when a religion is good, I conceive it will support itself. And it, when it does not support itself and God does not take care to support it so that its leaders are obliged to call for help of the civil power, this is a sign I apprehend of its being a what? So he's saying, and if a church has to raise up and needs the civil power in any way, shape, or form, there's a problem because God is the one that upholds his church on all different ways. Amen? Amen. President George Washington, 1789, every man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshiping the deity according to what? To the dictates of his own conscience. Amen? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Taylor, Ulysses Grant, Theodore Roosevelt, John Kennedy, the only Catholic president, all of them stating separate church and state. Look at what John Kennedy said. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is what? Absolute. Where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners from whom to vote where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. Amen? Every single, I'm going to send you all of these quotes and all of this information, all of the quotes. Every single president and the foundation of this country has been in separation of church and state. But my question to you, and we are going to finish with this question is, how is it possible that this nation, Founded on Christian principles, a constitutional government with balance of power and separation of church and state can get to deviate from its principles. When did this change begin? Prophecy says that as great as this nation has been, it is going to deviate from its ways. And we can already see it in so many ways that this has been happening, especially since September 11th. Things have changed radically and they are going to continue to change and they are going to continue to get worse. How and when did this start that this country was so founded and protected? It all began right here. This is where it happened. The coming together of church and state, Ronald Reagan and John Paul II. Amen? And what happened? You need to come tonight at 6 o'clock. Because I'm going to show you a video done by the Vatican with the United States together. They did a documentary. 
with the History Channel. Fascinating stuff. They were in her world. And all of these prophecies that we've been talking about, they bring it out to light. Amen? I'm going to show you about a 10-minute clip showing what happened here, how this all dealt. And the documentary done by the Vatican themselves is going to show us exactly and prove every single point, my loved ones. This great country that we love, amen, that is a leader in so many different ways, right? People look up to us in different parts of the world. They also look down to us because sometimes we act like a dragon, right? But this great country, the Bible says, is going to lift up an image to the Vatican. It's going to lift up that image. It's going to bring together church and state. It's going to lift it up, and it's going to help the Vatican restore its, its, its civil power and it's going to come back and enforce this system again. Now, we have been very lucky in this country because we haven't seen any of this stuff. But the great majority of the world throughout history has been under some type of oppression in some way, shape, or form. We haven't lived it. Maybe some of you have in different parts of the world before you came here, or maybe. But we all know of our grandparents or our great-grandparents in some way, shape, or form before they came here have suffered oppression, right? And even people here that have also done through it. So this is nothing new to the world. This might be new to us inside of this country, but this is nothing new in that sense. Is everybody following me? And this is what it is. This is the coming together, my loved ones. This is the beginning of Babylon. This is this new world order as it's termed popularly, but the Bible calls it Babylon where the Vatican and the United States are going to come together. And there are more players involved because as we said, this is a world system. We're just starting up. We're just getting warmed up. We already know about the Vatican. We started today. When you come back later on, we're going to start breaking out all of those other characteristics, and we're going to show you. I'm going to show you evidence how all of these things have happened, and they're happening at a rapid speed. It's amazing and fascinating how Bible prophecy is being fulfilled in our times. Is everybody with me? So we return tonight at 6 o'clock. Revelation reveals the image of the beast, part two. I'm going to start at 6 o'clock. We're going to have a song. We're going to start immediately. Presentation probably lasts about 40 minutes. Right? Then you'll have a break, and then we come back. Well, don't leave, but you'll come back right, for the 7 o'clock presentation, Babylon the harlot and her abominations. Everybody with me? Is everybody, are you feeling good? Amen? We're just getting warmed up. This is what we're going to do now. Do we do not need to be afraid? Who says amen? amen. It's all going to be all right. Why? Because God tells us in Isaiah 41.10 what? Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help, I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous, who is at the righteous right hand of the Father? Who is upholding us? How many people want to make this promise part of their lives? How many people want to put this and seal this on their minds and in their hearts? Then there's something else we have to do, you know that? To be able to call to heaven and say, God, I, I ask for this promise that it be fulfilled in my life. We have to do something else. And it's found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be given to you. If we make God first in my own life, in my marriage, in my family, in my children, in my home, if you make God first in your life, God promises that he will supply you all your needs and more. Amen? He will give you what you need, but God has to be first. These prophecies, knowing these things, are not going to save you. It's Jesus Christ that saves us. Amen? But those that love Christ will pay attention to the prophecies because the prophecies are here to warn us and prepare us for the things that are coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the blessing. Thank you for this time that we have been able to share and study prophecy. And we ask, Father, that you continue to be with us as we continue, come, come back tonight. And also as we uh, go down, Father, to continue to bless and guide us in every way and, and continue to strengthen us in your word. Thank you for the blessing, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And when you walk out, you'll get the study guide of uh, the United States in Bible prophecy. Happy Sabbath. Everyone.